الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون رب الشلي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني أفكو قولي My respected people on the dais, my respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's my pleasure and an honor to be in this esteemed university, UITM. And the topic for this evening's talk of mine is, what is the purpose of our life? This is a question which very few people really think that what is the purpose of our life? What is the purpose of our existence? What are we doing here? What are we here for? Let us start analyzing from here itself and I would like to ask the audience this question that how many from here have ever thought the reply, the answer to this question, what is the purpose of our life? Please raise your hand. How many from the audience have ever thought at least once in our life, the reply to the question, what is the purpose of our life? Please raise your hand. Okay, maybe 50 hands are raised or 60, 70 out of maybe a few thousand. Not bad, a couple of percentage, alhamdulillah. At least 3-4% from us have tried to think to this query, what is the purpose of our life? One may ask me, the Dr. Zakir, is it really required to answer this question? Do we really have to think what is the purpose of our life? Let me give you some examples. Then you realize what is the importance to know what is the purpose of our life. Once there was a traveler who comes at a crossroad and he asks the passerby, where does this road lead to? The passerby asks him the question, where do you want to go? He says, I don't know. So the passerby replies, then it makes no difference which road you choose. If you want to go anywhere, you don't know, then it makes no difference which road you choose. Because you have no goal. Imagine there is a builder who lays the foundation of a building. And when you ask him, how many stories building do you want to build? And he says, I don't know. What is the area of the building which you want to build? He says, I don't know. That means he has no goal. I would like to give you some few more examples. Once a man asks his neighbor, your dog keeps on chasing cars and vehicles. I wonder, will he ever be able to catch up with a car? So the neighbor replies, I'm not so much concerned whether he'll be able to catch up with the car or not. I'm thinking what will the dog do once he catches up with the car? That means the neighbor was far thinking that even if he catches up with the car, if the dog catches up with the car, what will he do? That means the dog has a purposeless goal. Goal is there to catch up with the car, but purposeless goal. And many of us human beings, we have purposeless goals. When we ask most of the human beings, what are you doing? They will say, we are doing graduation. What will you do after finishing your graduation? They say, I don't know. 
their goal is to become a graduate but why you want to become a graduate they don't know goal is there but a purposeless goal and many of our students they want to copy their friends why you want to become a graduate because my friend wants to become a graduate <laughs> what will you do after become a graduate i don't know you have chosen commerce why have you chosen commerce because my friend has chosen commerce what will you do after after become a bcom bachelor in commerce i don't know what will your friend do after she becomes a bachelor in commerce i don't know purposeless goals sometimes many human beings want to just copy without reason some of us human being we want to copy celebrities film stars actors and i am born in the city of mumbai it is known as bollywood you may have heard of mumbai it produces the maximum number of films in the world more than even hollywood i was born in the city called as mumbai which is bollywood and we find in mumbai many people coming from villages all over india coming to mumbai when you ask them why they have seen the hindi movie where the actor amita bachchan comes to bombay overnight he becomes a multi millionaire within a few days he become a multi millionaire so these poor people coming from all the villages of india they think that if they come to bombay they too will become a multi millionaire overnight just copying actors and actresses some of us human beings we copy models and when you ask someone why did you buy this santro i10 car so he will tell you because sharukh khan comes in that ad sharukh khan drives santro i10 sharukh khan is one of the famous actors i think he's famous he's even famous in malaysia yeah. ah mashallah see <laughs> sharukh khan means everyone knows sharukh khan i did not know that sharukh khan and amitabh bachchan are so famous here they want to buy santro i10 because sharukh khan drives that car let me tell you i doubt whether sharukh khan owns a santro i10 he may be owning a bmw or a mercedes or a rolls roy i think the only time he might have sat in the santro i10 was maybe for doing the advertisement that's it many of us we just follow models and when we ask why have you bought the tagore watch you know sharukh khan wears tagore watch i doubt whether he wore tagore watch before he became an actor what has tagore watch got to do with his acting we are just copying the celebrities the actors the models without realizing whether it's a fact or not and this is how the ad industry it flourishes it is more of an artificial world let me give you example of a businessman a very rich businessman he buys a textile company and when you ask that businessman why have you bought a textile company he says because a textile company makes a lot of profit so he has a goal his goal is to make profit but when we ask him the question what profit do you make in textile industry he says i don't know do you have a feasibility report of this textile company he says i don't know have you hired a ceo who is expert in textile he says no do you know where to buy this textile raw material he said i don't know where will you sell the textile i don't know so he has a goal to make profit but no planning this is an example of a businessman who has a goal he wants to make a profit but no planning let me give you another example there is a student in the science university and his goal is to become the best scientist of the world so he does a research who is the best scientist that has ever been born in human history and he gets the answer isaac newton he has a goal 
to become the best scientist in the world his research is correct the best scientist is isaac newton then he studies the lifestyle of isaac newton and he tries he tries to imitate he tries then he starts keeping long curly hair like isaac newton he wears clothes like isaac newton he wears shoes like isaac newton this person has a goal he has a planning but wrong planning do you think the hair will make him a good scientist the clothes will make him a good scientist the shoes will make him a good scientist has a goal has a planning but wrong planning so with these examples you come to know how important it is to have a goal and correct planning most of us human beings we are like that traveler traveling in a road without knowing where to go anywhere or like the builder who's building a building without knowing how tall the building is what is the area of the building or the dog which is chasing car chasing a goal which with with a purposeless goal or the friend copying the or a man copying the friend or imitating the celebrity actor or a model or a businessman buying a textile company has a goal but no plan or a student wanting to become the best scientist has a goal has a plan but wrong planning coming back to the question who is the person who can give the best reply to this question what is the purpose of life who is it do you think it is dr sakin naik and the answer is no do you think a scientist can give answer to this question and the answer is no do you think a psychologist can give the answer to this question what is the purpose of a life and the answer is no the best who can give the reply to the question what is the purpose of our life is the creator of the human beings the creator allah subhanahu wa taala is the best who can give a reply to this question what is the purpose of life and allah says in his last and final revelation the glorious quran in surah ariyat chapter number 51 verse number 56 the ayah i started my talk with allah says wa ma khalaqtu al jinna wal insa illa liyabtun that i have only created the jinn and the men but to worship me the arabic word used here is ibada coming from the root word abd which means a slave a servant ibada means servitude means obedience meaning worship when we follow the commandments of allah subhanahu wa taala of almighty god our creator we are doing ibada if we follow the five pillars of islam what allah subhanahu wa taala has prescribed for us you are doing ibadah if you believe in one god and believe there's no other god worthy of worship and prophet muhammad is the messenger of allah subhanahu wa taala peace be upon him you are doing ibadah if you offer salah you are doing ibadah if you give zakat you are doing ibadah if you fast in the month of ramadan you are doing ibadah if you follow the guidance of the quran by loving your neighbor as allah says in surah maun chapter 107 you are doing ibada if you abstain from the prohibited thing which allah said in the quran you are doing ibada if you abstain from having alcohol as mentioned in the quran in surah maida chapter 5 verse number 90 then you are doing ibada if you abstain from having pork as mentioned in surah maida chapter 5 verse number 3 you are doing ibada if you abstain from stealing from lying from robbing you are doing ibada in short if you follow the commandments of allah subhanahu wa taala and abstain from things that yes prohibited you are doing ibadah any human being can convert each and every action of ours into ibadah into worship if he or she fulfills only two criteria number 1 that action should only and only be done for the sake of allah subhanahu wa taala our creator and number 2 it should be done according to the sunnah of the last and final messenger prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so every action of ours 
if you fulfill these two conditions, do it for the sake of Allah alone, and do it according to the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are doing ibadah. So worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so easy. Every action of ours, if you convert and fulfill these two criteria, you are doing ibadah. If you allow me to call the human being the machine, I would say that the human being is the most complicated machine on the face of the earth. It is more complicated than the most powerful computer in the world. Now, whenever we buy a machine, along with the machine, we get an instruction manual. More complicated the machine, more requirement of an instruction manual. If you buy a DVD player, it tells you that if you want to play the DVD, insert the DVD, press the play button. If you want fast forward, press the fast forward. Don't drop it from height, it will get damaged. Don't immerse it in water, it will get spoiled. The instruction manual tells you the do's and don'ts of the machine. If human being is the most complicated machine, don't you think it requires an instruction manual? The instruction manual for the human being is the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran. The glorious Quran is the last and final instruction manual for the human beings. The do's and don'ts for a human being is mentioned in this glorious Quran. What is good and what is bad for the human being is mentioned here. And it is revealed by the creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone may ask me, Brother Zakir, why should we worship Allah? What benefit will Allah get by worshipping Him? Does Allah require worship? Why should we praise Him? Does Allah require our praise? And that's a very good question. But unfortunately, very few people reply to this question. Why does Allah require our worship? Allah replies in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 15. O ye men, you who are in need of Allah. Allah is free of all wants, worthy of all praises. Allah is very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require anyone. He is independent of everything in this world. Everything is dependent on Him. He is independent of everything. Allah is free of all wants, worthy of all praises. Why should we praise Allah? When we say Allah Hu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, do you think Allah becomes greater? Allah is already the greatest. Whether you say Allah Hu Akbar one time, ten times, hundred times, thousand times, Allah is already the greatest. He will not, he cannot become more great. He is already the greatest. Irrespective of whether you say or not, it makes no difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the question is, why do we praise Allah? It is human nature that whoever we praise and we think someone who's great or we worship, we tend to follow his advice. Let me give you an example. That if your mother has a heart attack and a layman on the road comes and tells you that why don't you treat your mother with so and so thing. Later on, you are aware that there is a very famous cardiologist the most famous heart specialist in the world. He comes and gives you the treatment. Whose treatment will you follow? The layman or the cardiologist? Ah, because you know he's famous. Oh, number one in the world. So the moment you know that he's famous and he's well known for that, it is human nature that you will follow his advice. So the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to praise him, we say, Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the most wise, Allah is the most knowledgeable. When we say this, and when Allah gives us advice, it becomes human nature that when we say he's the greatest, we have to follow the advice of the greatest. When we say he's the most knowledgeable, we have to follow the advice of the most knowledgeable. When we say he's the most wise, we have to follow the advice of the most wise. So Allah is asking us to praise him, not to benefit him, but to benefit us. When we praise Allah, and when Allah gives us advice in the Quran, 
and through our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we tend to follow the advice. Who does it benefit? The human beings, not Allah. And when Allah sees that His creation are benefiting, He gets happy. So we praise Allah for the benefit of the human being, not for the benefit of Allah. So this is the basic logic why Allah asks us to worship Him and to praise Him so that it benefits us, so that we follow the guidance of the Quran and the Sai Hadith, so that we are successful in this world. Let me give you another example. That there is a couple who has no children. And that couple is sad because they have no children. We have another example of a couple who has a child and after growing, when he reaches the age of teen, 15, 16, the child dies. This couple is more sad than the first couple. First couple is sad because they had no children. Second couple is sad because they had a child, but the child died at the age of 16. We have a third couple who has a son, who has a child. They bring the child with love, affection, give them all love, care, all the luxury of the world. He becomes 20 years, 30 years. When he becomes an adult, he starts disrespecting the parents. He starts disobeying the parents. He does not take care of the parents. He treats the parent with harshness. The third parent, the turmoil for the third parent, the pain for the third parent is much more than the first and the second parent. Any human being, whichever religion he belongs to, whatever ideology he belongs to, he has to agree that every children should love and respect their parent. Whichever philosophy he belongs to, it is basic. Why? Because our parent gave us birth. Our mother gave us birth. They took care of us when we were kids, when we were infants. They cherished us. And isn't it required that when we have to respect our parent, what about respect to our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has not only created us but has also created our parents? Don't you think our creator requires multiple times more, infinite time more respect than our parents? And the answer is yes. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, that we have ordained for you that you worship none but Allah, that you be kind to the parents, and if one of them or both of them reach old age, don't say oof to them, don't say a word of contempt, and address them with honor, and lower to them your wing of humility, and pray to thy Lord, that bless them as they cherish me in childhood. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that after worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to love and respect your parents. And if any one of the parents or both of them reach old age, you know when a person becomes old, they tend to be a bit bickery. They tend, the nature changes. They may be a little bit irritating. Here Allah tells you, that if one of them or both of them reach old, they don't even say off to them. Don't say a word of contempt. But lower to them your wing of humility. And address them with honor. And pray to Allah that bless them as they cherish me in childhood. So imagine our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves infinite time more love and respect than our parents. How many times do we human beings thank our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the things He has given us? How many times do we thank the house that we live in that He has provided us with? The clothes that we wear, how many times do we thank Him? The food that we eat, how many times do we thank Allah? The water that we drink, if you don't get water for a couple of weeks, You'll die. 
How many of us thank Allah for the water? Let me ask this question. From here, how many of us have ever thanked Allah for the air we breathe? Please raise your hand. The air that we breathe. How many have thanked Allah? MashaAllah, two people here. The air that we breathe. Four, four people. One, two, four, four people. Out of 2,000? Air, if we do not get for few minutes, for about half an hour, you will die. We take it for granted. Air is free. What is there to think about it? If someone pinches their nose and closes their mouth for a few minutes or half an hour, you will die. All this niyama Allah has given. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 34, O Amen, if you count the favors of Allah, you will not be able to number them. Man is most unjust and ungrateful. Allah says in Surah Dariya, chapter number 100, verse number 6, that verily man is most ungrateful to his Lord. Allah has given us so many gifts, multiple, hundreds, thousands, you cannot count, millions. If you start counting, you will not be able to number them. Infinite. But Allah says man is verily most ungrateful and unjust to his Lord. Yet, when you ask for forgiveness, Allah forgives you. When we human beings, the amount of sins we do, when we ask for forgiveness, Allah forgives you. Allah says, Wallahu ghafoorur rahim. And Allah is of forgiving most merciful. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 25. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 74. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 49. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 119. In Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 63. And Surah Buruj, chapter number 85, verse number 14. Wallahu ghafoor rahim And Allah is of forgiving most merciful. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, that all the sins that we do in the full day, if you ask for forgiveness in the night, Allah forgives you. All the sins that you do in the night, it may be more than a mountain. You ask for forgiveness in the day and Allah forgives you. Wallahu ghafoorur rahim. Allah is of forgiving most gracious. And Allah says in the Quran that the biggest sin that any human being can do, the Quran, the Ghunaya Kabira number one Kabair, it is shirk. Associating partners with Allah, worshipping anyone besides Allah. It is the biggest sin. Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 48, and Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 116, that if anyone commits shirk associating partners with Allah, he will not forgive you. Any other sin, if he pleases, he, will, he may forgive you. But anyone who associates partners with Allah, he has strayed far away. And the other verse says, he has committed a grievous sin. That means according to the Quran, any other sin if you do, Allah may forgive you if he pleases. But the sin of shirk, associating partners with Allah, if you die as a mushrik without asking for forgiveness, you will never be forgiven on the day of death. It's before dying. If you ask for forgiveness, Allah will even forgive the shirk. But if you die as a mushrik, associating partners with Allah, worshipping anyone besides our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that sin will never ever be forgiven. It is more heinous than any other sin in the world. We human beings, we are one of the best creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah 13, chapter number 95, verse number 4, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Verily, we have created human beings in the best of molds. We human beings, we have been created in the best of molds. 
we human being allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is one of the best creation because all the creation except the men and the jinn allah has given us a free will all the other creations of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they do not have a free will but the men and the jinn they have a free will that they can either obey allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they can disobey the angels they always obey allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have no choice but we as human beings if we follow allah's commandments after choice is given to us we become higher than the angels but if we disobey allah then we become like the satan Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk chapter number 67 verse number 2 Alladhi khalaqal mawta wal hayata It is Allah who has given death and life It is Allah who has created death and life To test which of you is good in deeds Alladhi khalaqal mawta wal hayata Liyabluhu kum ayyukum ahsanu amala Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds So this life for the human beings is a test for the hereafter Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anfal chapter number 8 verse number 28 that your wealth and your children are a test for you Allah repeats the message in Surah Talaq chapter number 65 verse number 15 that wa amwalu wa awladu your wealth and your children are a fitna, are a test for you. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155, that surely we will test you with fear or hunger, or with loss of goods or lives, or the fruits of which you have toiled. But give, but give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere. Allah is telling that surely we will test each and every human being either with fear or hunger or with loss of lives your relatives, your children, your parents or loss of goods or loss of the fruit that you have earned in your life and Allah says give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere those who have sabr this life is a test for the hereafter Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter number 3 verse number 185 Every soul shall have a taste of death And the final recompense will be on the day of judgment And anyone who saves himself from the hellfire And enters the garden Has achieved the objective of this world For this life is nothing but mere goods and chattels of deception Allah is telling that every soul shall have a taste of death and the final recompense the final accountability reward etc would be on the day of judgment and on that day the person who saved from the hellfire and enters Jannah has achieved the objective of this world has really passed the test of this world for this world is nothing but mere goods and chattels of deception. So this world that we are living in, Allah says, is nothing but mere goods and chattels of deception. Our main goal is the Akhirah. And who passes the test is one who enters Jannah and is saved from the hellfire. The main objective of this world is to achieve Jannah. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 71 that verily we give gifts of sustenance to some people more than others Allah says in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 165 that we raise some people higher in ranks and test them with the gifts we have given and as I mentioned earlier Allah says in Surah Anfal chapter 8 verse number 28 that your wealth and your children are a test for you Allah is testing you with gifts Allah is testing you with the wealth Allah is testing you with your children Allah says in Surah Munafikun chapter number 63 verse number 9 
that do not let your wealth, your riches, and your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah. Allah is telling you that the niyamah He has given you, the wealth and your children, don't let your wealth and your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110. Kuntum khaira ummatin khrijat lin nas. Oi Muslims, ye are the best of peoples of all for mankind. Allah is giving us Muslims an honor that we are the khaira ummah, the best of people. Whenever there is honor, it is always followed up with responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. In an organization, the CEO has got more honor than a manager. A manager has got more honor than a clerk. In the same fashion, the CEO, chief executive officer, has got more responsibility than a manager. A manager has got more responsibility than a clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. In this verse of the Quran of Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, Allah is saying, Kuntum khaira ummatin khridat lin nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. He is giving us an honor and Allah is calling us the khaira ummah. The best of people evolved for mankind. Don't you think we have responsibility? The answer is given in the same verse and Allah continues. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. Allah is calling us the Khaira Ummah because we are supposed to enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, if we don't do dawah, we are unfit to be called as Khaira Ummah. We are unfit to be called as Muslim. It is compulsory that every Muslim when he sees a Muslim who is doing something wrong, he should do islah, he should correct him. When he meets a non-Muslim, he should do dawah, he should call him towards the religion of Allah, Islam. Compulsory, it's a fard. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 104, that let there arise out of you a band of people, a group of people, that enjoin people towards the good, and forbid them from doing wrong, these are the ones that shall attain felicity. Ya Allah is talking about full-time dais. How we are full-time doctors, full-time engineers, full-time lawyers. How many full-time dais do we have? You can count them on your fingertips. The criteria for entering Jannah, the criteria for achieving our goal is given in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103. Verse number one to three, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal asr, by the token of time, innal insana la fi khusr, verily man is in loss. Illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqa wa tawasaw bil sabr. Except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. Allah is telling in the Surah Al-Asr that man is in khasara, man is in loss, total loss, except those who have four criteria. Number one, those who have Iman. Number two, those who have Amal Saliha, those who have righteous deed. Number three, those who have Tawasaw Bil Haq, inviting people to truth, doing Dawah and Islam. And the fourth, Tawasaw Bil Sabr, those who enjoin people was patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria according to Surah Al Asr for any human being to go to Jannah. If any one of these four are missing, under normal circumstances, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim, you may be praying five times a day, you may be giving zakat, fasting in the month of Ramadan. But if you don't do dawah according to Surah Al Asr, under normal circumstances, you shall not go to Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, that's Allah's prerogative. But under normal circumstances, all four things are equally important Iman, righteous deed, Watawasaw bil haq, dawah, and Watawasaw bil sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. This are the, these are the four criteria. And Imam Shafi, Rahimullah, 
May Allah have mercy on him. He said that if this surah alone, Surah Al Asr, was revealed, it would have been sufficient for the hidayah, for the guidance of humankind. Means this surah is so powerful that only if this surah was revealed from the Quran alone, it would have been sufficient for the guidance of humanity. Any verse of the Quran you pick up, invariably it will fall under these four criteria. Either Iman, righteous deed, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Hadith of Tirmidhi, Hadith number 2517, that one of the Sahabas asked the Prophet, that should I tie my camel and then trust in God, or should I leave my camel and then trust in God? The Prophet said, tie your camel and then trust in God. That means we have faith in Allah, but that doesn't mean that we leave the camel, we leave the door open and say, the robber will not come. You don't do planning and say, Allah is there. You trust in Allah, but tie your camel. Tie your camel means you do planning. You do goal setting. Just by saying I have faith in Allah, I will not work, I sit at home, I will get all the food, everything, Allah is there. That is not part of Islam. Trust in God, but tie your camel to the best of your ability. Tie your camel, then trust in Allah. Tie your camel means there should be goal setting. There should be planning. And we find various management gurus who have goal setting and you might have heard of the famous goal meeting, SMART, S-M-A-R-T. You know, Stephen Coe and others. I don't agree with many of the points. We'll not go to that. Our goal setting is Islamic. I-S-L-A-M-I-C. I-S-L-A-M-I-C. There are seven points. Number one of our goal setting of a Muslim is, number one, I, Islamic. It should be as per the guidelines of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one in our goal setting is Islamic. I. Our goal setting should be as per the guidelines of Allah, that the glorious Quran, and the saying of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the authentic hadith. Number two, S. It should be specific. Once there was a teacher who was teaching archery. And he told his students that aim your arrow exactly at the eye of the bird. Then he asks the first student, have you aimed? All of them said, yes, we aimed. What do you see? The first student see. The first student said, I see the forest. I see the tree. I see the bird sitting on the tree and I see the eye of the bird. The teacher asked the second student, what do you see? He said, I see the tree, I see the bird and I see the eye of the bird. The teacher asked the third student, what do you see? The third student said, I see the bird and the eye of the bird. The teacher asked the fourth student, what do you see? The student said, I can only see the eye of the bird. And the teacher says, let the arrow go. And the student lets the arrow go and it exactly hits at the eye of the bird. The moral of the story is that your goal setting should be specific. Not vague. Here the target was eye of the bird. A bullseye. Third, lucrative. I-F-L. L for lucrative, profitable. And most of the Muslims know that one of the best dua you can do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabbana atina fid dunya hasnato fil akhirat hasnu kina ta binna. Oh Lord, give us the best in this world and in the akhira and save us from the torment of the hellfire. This was is there in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number two zero one. Who knows this dua? Who knows this dua? Raise your hand. Who knows the dua? Rabbana atina fid dunya hasnato. 
Why are you so lazy? MashaAllah. Almost most of the Muslims know, MashaAllah. You should know this dua. One of the most common dua. Rabbana Atina, oh my Lord. Fit dunya. Oh my Lord. Give me the best in this world and the akhirah and save me from the torment of hellfire. Now my simple question to you is, MashaAllah, I think 100% knew and they know the dua. Maybe one or two didn't raise then, but I'm sure even they know the dua. Now my simple question to you is, who knows the verse before this dua? Surah Bakra chapter number 2, verse number 200. Raise your hand. Who knows the verse before the dua? Rabban Atina Surah Bakra chapter 2, verse 201. Who knows Surah Bakra chapter number 2, verse number 200? Raise your hand. Not a single. If you know Surah Bakra chapter 2, verse number 200, your 201 will be better. MashaAllah, all of us know Rabban Atina, but unfortunately, hardly very few know the verse before because if you know the verse before you will know the value of this dua verse one verse before rabbanatina surah bakra chapter number two verse number 200 says there are those people who say oh lord give me the best in this world allah replies allah will give him the best of the world but will not give akhirah then Allah continues and says, There are those people who say, Rabbana Atina fit dunya hasna. So give us the best in this world and in the hereafter and save us from the torment of hellfire. That means Allah says, If you ask this dunya, Allah will give you the dunya, dunya but will not give you akhira. So that dua is useless. But there are good people like us, mashallah, all of them. We say, Rabbana Atina fit dunya. Oh Lord, give us the best in this world and the akhirah and save us from the torment of the hellfire now when you know the previous verse which of the two is more important dunya or akhirah which is more important not which is important which is more important akhirah Allah says in surah Hud chapter number 11 that if you if you ask this dunya I will give you this dunya but will not give you akhirah surah Hud chapter 11 verse 14 15 next verse says that if you ask for akhirah Allah will give you akhirah and this dunya also so those who ask only for akhirah Allah will give you this dunya also so between the two which is more important akhirah but you are permitted to ask for this dunya also but more important is Akhirah. But in our dua, more often what we ask, Allah, give me this, give me a degree, give me this, give me so much money you want. All these things we ask Allah. You can ask. It is allowed. It's not haram. You can even ask for a shoelace to Allah. No problem. It's permitted. But the best is Akhirah. If you ask Akhirah, Allah will give you the dunya also. And here we find that when you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best is to ask for akhirah, you can also ask for the dunya, the best is you can ask for both, no problem. The good in this world as well as the akhirah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that our goal setting L coming to lucrative profitable in dunya and akhira both best in akhira then is dunya so our goal setting I S L third goal is lucrative profitability fourth is A appropriate apt achievable but whatever you are asking for it should be within the purview of Quran and Sunnah M measurable. Can you measure it? The goal you're asking for, can you measure it? For example, if you want to make the tallest building in the world, is it measurable? Yes. Today the tallest building in the world is Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Previously it was Petronas. Many years back. Today yet it is the tallest twin tower, but not the tallest building. 
So we know Burj Khalifa is 824 meters tall. So if you want to make a taller building than that, you have to make a building taller than 824 meters. It's measurable. M. I. Intention. The goal you're setting, the intention should only be to please Allah, our Creator, and follow the guidelines of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our intention should be only to please Allah alone and nothing else. If your intention is to please your family members, to please the people, then that is not Islamic goal setting. Your main goal should be to please Allah. And while pleasing Allah, if you're pleasing other people, no problem. But number one should be to please Allah. The last is C, consistent. Whatever you do, do consistently. For example, you say, I want to complete reading of the Quran. Good. You want to read Quran every day. So make a target. I want to read every day one juice. Or I want to read the Quran every day half juice. Or maybe quarter juice, five pages. No problem. But be consistent. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Allah loves those things which are done consistently, even if it's small. With things which are done consistently, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Allah loves those things. Then you do one time and even a great deal. The things which are done consistently, even if it is small, is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Consistency. So this is the goal setting of a Muslim Islamic. Now let me give you an example, which is very often given by many management gurus. And some of you may have heard, most of you may not have heard, the name of the lady, Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Rudolph, she was born, her legs were paralyzed because of polio. And from childhood, she had polio. The doctor said that she would never be able to set foot on the earth. Her mother was a lady of strong willpower. She told her daughter, Wilma, you think what you want to do. You dream what you want to do and you will be able to do it. So Wilma said, I want to become the fastest woman on the face of the earth. Imagine a girl who has polio, who can't put her feet on the ground. She dreams to become the fastest woman on the face of the earth. At the age of nine, she gives away her braces. She says, I don't want it. At the age of 13, she takes part in a running race and comes out last. But she was consistent, so much so that in the year 1960, in Olympics, she gets three gold medal. Gold medal for women 100 meters, gold medal for women 200 meters, and gold medal for four into 100 meter relay. And you can go on the net and Google her name, Wilma Rudolph, and you'll get, she was the first woman on the face of the earth in 1960, who was paralyzed, had polio, and she became the fastest woman on the face of the earth. Now this example is given by many management gurus. And as I mentioned, management gurus, their goal setting is SMART. S-M-A-R-T. Some are correct, some may not be correct. S is specific. Wilma had a specific goal. She wanted to become the fastest woman in the world. M, measurable. Can she measure? Yes. The fastest woman at that time, maybe 10 seconds, 9 seconds, or maybe between 9 and 11 seconds. Measurable. She had to do a timing of better than 10 or 9 seconds. Possible. Measurable. A. Achievable. She thought, yes, she can. Achievable. R. Realistic. She thought, yes. Time. Time bound. Yes, she has to do it, you know. In the teens or the 20s, if she becomes too old, then she cannot be the fastest woman. Time bound. This is the smart goal. Let us check what was Wilma's goal as, co as compared to Islamic goal setting? Islamic goal setting number one is I. That is, Islamic as per the guidelines of Quran and say Hadith. I doubt whether Wilma's goal setting was as per the Quran and say Hadith. Yes, specific? Yes, it was specific. She wanted to become the fastest woman in the world. And lucrative? Profitable? Yes, for this world, yes, profitable. 
fastest woman in the world. She gets a gold medal. She got three gold medal fame in this world. Akhira. Allah says, if you ask for this world, we give you this world. We won't give you akhira. So Islamically, world she may have benefited. Akhira, no. A, apt, appropriate, achievable. Yes, she thought she could. And measurable, yes, she could measure the time. Less than 10 seconds or 9 seconds. Intention. Intention should be for Allah alone. I doubt whether the intention was for Allah alone. See, consistent, yes, she was consistent. Till she became the fastest woman. So some things benefiting overall in the Islamic goal setting, not successful, but given examples by most of the management gurus. Wilma Rudolph. You type on the Google, you'll get the reply. But if you compare with Islamic goal setting, unfortunately, in this world, possible. Akhira. Allah says in Surah Imran, chapter 385, that Kullu every soul shall have a taste of death. The final recompense is on the day of judgment. And the person who is saved from the hellfire and enters Jannah has achieved the objective of this life. I doubt whether Wilma would have achieved the objective of this life. Maybe her name is there on the internet. But whether it is there with the angels in Jannah, Allah. Let me give you another example of a man with small means. The person who changed my life, who changed me from a doctor of a body to doctor of a soul, and that is our late Sheikh Ahmad Idad. And if you know his life history, he was born in Surat, in the village Tatkeshwar in India. At a very young age, maybe at the age of six, he migrates to South Africa. Coming from a very poor background, poor family, so much so that he had to leave school at the age of six to earn his living. And he becomes a salesman. And in South Africa, he used to sell furniture and also driving the car, driving the van. And very often when he used to go to work, the Christian missionaries used to come and hammer him. They used to pose verses of the Quran attacking Islam and saying, how come you are a Muslim? What reply do you have for this verse of the Quran? And he could not reply. Imagine a person who's only past standard six. His goal at that time was to reply to these Christian missionaries who are attacking Islam. By Allah's grace, he comes across a very old book filled with dust by the name of Izharul Haq, the truth revealed by Mawlana Rahmatullah Karanvi, which has the reply to many of these allegations Christian missionaries do. He read that book and he started his mission. So much so that after 40 years, Sheikh Didad alone was sufficient for the full Christianity who were attacking Islam. Alhamdulillah. Alone, single-handedly. Six standard pass. They have institute in Zumar Institute only studying how does Didad give lectures. Alone, single-handedly. At a time when Muslims were hammered. We were used as doormats. When Christian missionaries came at the Muslim door, they used the Quran to attack us and we didn't have the answer. This person of small means, Sheikh Ahmed Didad, only six standard pass. His mission was to reply to the Christian missionary. In the 1980s, 70s started, 80s became famous. And before he had the debate with Reverend Jimmy Swagat, at that time in the mid 80s, Reverend Jimmy Swagat was number one missionary in the world, Christian missionary in the world. Before having the debate with Reverend Jimmy Swagat in USA, he goes to Pakistan for a lecture tour and one of his fans tells him that Sheikh Didad, I'm your fan. But my advice to you is, I'm warning you, don't have a debate with Jimmy Swagat. The eloquence that he had in his speech, Jimmy Swagat, he could mesmerize people. He told Sheikh Didad, I'm your fan. But if you have debate with Jimmy Swagat, he will chew you and spit you out. Who's telling Didat? His fan. Jimmy Sagat was one of the best orators of the world. 
He had a budget of 400 million dollars a year. His daily expenditure was more than a million dollars to keep his head above water. 400 million dollars. That is more than 1600 million ringgit. Every day, more than 4 million ringgit a day. I don't know of any organization, Muslim organization in the world, which even has 10% budget of this. And Sheikh Didat, with Allah's help, he goes and has a debate with Jimmy Swaggart. And we know the outcome in 1984. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. The topic of the debate was, is the Bible God's word? And Alhamdulillah, it was a thumping success for our Mujahid Sheikh Ahmad Didat. So much so that in 1986, he gets the highest Islamic award of the world, King Faisal Prize for service of Islam. Imagine a six standard pass. King Faisal International Prize for service of Islam is the highest Islamic award in the world. It is equivalent to the Nobel Prize of the world. Any Islamic personality, if he wants to get the highest award, it is King Faisal Award. He didn't, he didn't want to get it. He did for the sake of Allah, he got the highest award in the world. Now let us see the goal setting. We compared the goal setting of Wilma Rudolph with the Islamic goal setting. Let's compare Sheikh Ahmed Didad with the Islamic goal setting. Number one, I. Islamic. Was it for the sake of Allah and the Rasul? Was it according to the guidelines of Quran and Hadith? And the answer is yes. Specific. Was his goal setting specific? Yes, it was very specific. His main purpose only was to reply to the allegations of the Christian missionaries against Islam. Give a fitting reply to the attacks done by the Christian missionary against Islam, against Quran. It was specific. Lucrative. Was it lucrative? He did it for Akhirah. He did for Akhirah for Allah's sake. Allah gave him the highest award in this world, the King Faisal Prize. Lucrative. Profitable. Did for Akhirah, Allah gave him dunya also. A. Was it apt? Was it appropriate? Alhamdulillah. Measurable. Yes, it was measurable. His thing was whatever attacks they made, whether it was 10, 20, 100,000, he wanted to reply to all. And he did it. I. Intention. His intention was mainly to please Allah. His intention wasn't to get faith. He wanted to please Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him fame also in this world. See, was he consistent? Yes. With small means, he was consistently did it for 40 years. And Allah gave him success. So when you compare the goal setting of Wilma Rudolph and Sheikh Ahmed Didad, there's a difference of chalk and cheese. The difference of chalk and cheese. Sheikh Ahmed Dida's goal setting was Islamic. Wilma's goal setting was smart, like the management gurus. Smart. Smart. Okay, for this world, maybe. But not Akhira. So all of us should realize that our goal setting should be on Islamic. The acronym is Islamic Guidelines. You know, most of us, most of the human beings, we plan how to earn a living, but we do not plan how to live. Let me repeat that. Most of us human beings, we plan how to earn a living. We do not plan how to live. And based on the earning that we do, we have our lifestyle. Depending on how much we earn, that type of house we have, that type of clothes we wear, that type of car we keep. How much we earn, that type of education we give to our children. As though our main goal of life is earning a living. And based on the earning, they lead the lifestyle and most, most of us are very happy. Okay, I'm earning so much ringgit. 5,000 ringgit, 10,000 ringgit. I'm having a lifestyle. And they're very happy. It's like shooting, a, shooting an arrow and drawing the bull's eye around it. You shoot the arrow, you earn and then you start living according to your earning. So you shoot, once you sh shoot anywhere blindly, then you draw the bullseye around it. Most of us, we plan to earn the living, but we don't plan our living. The right attitude is that we should plan our living. 
irrespective of what we earn irrespective of what we earn this is how we plan our living so if you plan according to the lifestyle of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the needs were so small the requirement was so less then irrespective of what you earn you'll be happy most of us human beings our life are centered around something or the other some of us we are self-centered self-centered means everything selfish i'm only bothered about myself i'm not bothered about others self-centered our beloved prophet Muhammad said mentioned say bukhari volume number one in hadith number 13 that he is not a true believer until he wishes for his brother the same thing what he wishes for himself that means a true muslim a true mu'min will wish for his brother the same thing what he wish for himself that means he cannot be self-centered some of us we are family centered we want to please our family our main goal in life is to please our family and to please our family we will change our values we will change our model we'll do anything as long as we please our family some of us want to please our parents they'll do anything for their parents it is good to please your parents I, and i gave the verse of the quran of surah Isra chapter 17 verse 23 24 talking about the respect to parents but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in surah luqman chapter number 31 verse number 14 that we have enjoined on the human beings to to be kind to the parents in travel upon travel did the mother bore you and in years twain was the weaning the allah is telling respect your parent especially your mother and she gave you birth and for two years she gave you winning praising praising immediately next verse surah luqman chapter 31 verse number 15 but if your parents strive and struggle do jihad strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides allah then do not obey them but live with them with love and companionship that means if your parents tell you to do something against allah and his rasul at that time you don't obey them you love them you respect them okay but if they go against Allah and His Rasul, do not obey them, but yet live with them with love and companionship. So these are guidelines. You can be parent-centered to a limit, not more than Allah and His Rasul. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, a believer is not a true believer unless he loves Allah and His Rasul more than any creation in this world. Unless you don't love Allah and the soul more than yourself, more than your parents, more than your brothers, more than your children, you cannot be a true Muslim. Your limits are there. You can be, you cannot be parent-centered completely, taking your parents above Allah and the soul. And sometimes the parent tells you things which are Islamic. Oh, my daughter, don't wear hijab. Okay, I'm parent-centered, don't wear hijab. Okay, my son, don't pay salah. You don't pay salah. It's not allowed. Love them, respect them. Limit. If they go against the teachings of Quran and say Hadith, love them, but don't obey them. Some people, they are wife-centered or spouse-centered. I'll do anything for my wife. If my wife wants a diamond necklace, I can't afford it. I will beg, borrow, steal, but give her the diamond necklace. Wife-centered. Loving your wife is good, but not to the extent of doing things which are haram stealing some people are children centered they want to please their children and many a time your son will tell father i want to go to america for studies you know the course in america will not get him any benefit but yet what do you do you beg borrow steal you take loan you keep your house on mortgage and you get money and you send him to america for a course which will not make any benefit and then you say my son is studying in america usa Deen and dunya both gone. Children centered. Everything is children. They are very proud. My son is studying in America as though he's gone to Jannah. So these are talking about family centered. We have some people who are society centered. They're more bothered about the society around them around what do they think about him they want to make the society think that I'm a very good person so the society center 
some people are bothered about the neighbor and let me give you an anecdote about how people are neighbor centered once an angel comes and asks a man whatever you ask i will give you but i will give you double to your neighbor the man is very happy okay whatever ask angel will give him the angel says what do you want so the man says give me an expensive rolex watch so the angel gives the man rolex watch to his neighbor he gives two rolex watch then he says give me a rolls roy car so the angel gives him a rolls roy car but gives the neighbor two rolls roy car huh? i get one he get two then he says give me a very big villa so the angel gives him one villa and gives the neighbor two villa so the man whose neighbor centered he said what is this what i'm getting giving double so he said okay angel fulfill my last wish what is it please 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 break my one eye so that i cannot see with that eye he tells the angel fulfill my last wish break my one eye sir, so that i cannot see with that one eye you know many people cannot see that their neighbor are flourishing they don't mind what's happening whether they are good or bad they want to be better than the neighbor so when he gets one watch the neighbor gets two watch when he gets one rose white car neighbor gets two rose white car he gets a big villa neighbor gets two villa so now to defeat the neighbor he is telling you break my one eye so the neighbor both his eye would be broken neighbor center you know suppose someone you say okay fine you will come second in the race in the full world a neighbor come first very good he said no no i don't mind coming second last as, as long as my neighbor come last in the world imagine the difference between second last and second he would prefer coming second last in the world and the neighbor coming last rather than he coming second in the world and neighbor coming first which is better coming second in the world and neighbor coming first is better than second last but the neighbor centered man will say no i don't want second in the world out of 7 and 1/2 billion people i would prefer coming second last as long as my neighbor comes last this is neighbor centered people society center some people are friend centered they want to please their friend as long as they friends they will do anything to make their friends happy some people are enemy centered they keep on thinking how is the enemy planning about me how is he trying to attack me so i'll defend myself how is he criticizing me so i'll give the reply their full life is revolving around what is the enemy thinking about him enemy centered these people are society centered full life they spend in trying to make the society happy or they becoming better in society we have another category of people who are material centered they are materialistic and those who are materialistic rich people they normally discuss things about material for example when they meet they say oh i have a tiger watch oh you have omega watch rolex oh patek philip patek philip oh what type of a bezel do you have what is the dial is it a limited edition is it gold plated is it platinum plated is it diamond studded so they spend their time discussing about the watches and all these people who are material center they don't have one watch they may be having 25 30 watches and then they see okay this watch i wore today or tomorrow when i go if the same people come they should not see the same watch so they keep a track of it okay i'll wear a different watch so people don't see the same watch the full life is planned in how to wear the watch when to wear what and they are very happy they are material centered when you go on a high level people are discussing about cars i've got a bmw car i've got mercedes car i've got maybach rolls royce if it's sports model then ferrari lamborghini maybach bugatti You know Bugatti? Who knows Bugatti? Mashallah. Oh, Mashallah! All sports-loving people. Who would like to own a Bugatti? Mashallah. When you go high level, people discuss about yachts. You know, car is car and watches are for lower people. When you go to multi-millionaire and billionaire, they discuss about yacht. How big is your yacht? how many cabin does it have what is the size of a yacht higher level jet oh you have a jet plane oh. 
How many seater? Six seater, eight seater, ten seater. How big is it? Is it Boeing? Is it Airbus? There is no end to it. There is no limit to it. As far as materialism is concerned, you can categorize in four different categories. Category one, people who can't afford it yet, they buy it by beg, borrow, steal, taking loan. This is haram, israf. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 25, 27, that do not be a spendthrift. For validity, the spendthrift is the brother of the devil. Your second category who can afford it, but they are dependent on that. I cannot leave without having my mercy. The people won't recognize it because they recognize the mercy is not him. So when he goes without a mercy, no one will give him respect. There's so much conscious that if I do not go in that big luxury car, people won't respect me. They're dependent on those luxury. This is also haram. Third category, he can afford it, but he's not dependent. It is mobile optional, but it is dangerous. It's khutwa to shaitan. It can lead you towards makhru and haram. The highest category is the person who can afford it and yet does not have it. The example of Prophet Muhammad He could have the luxury of the world. He could have had the wealth of the world as a footstep. He did not. That is the highest level. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6384, that Allah says, if he gives a valley of gold to man, he would desire for a second. If he give him the second value of gold, he would desire for the third. For only a handful of dust is required for the belly of the human being. You know, no one in the world owns the value of gold. Even Bill Gates doesn't own. So beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Allah says if he gives the value of gold, the person would want a second one. If Allah gives the second one, he would want a third one. A man will never get satisfied. Materialistic, a man can never get satisfied. It will keep on wanting more and more. There is no limit. Some people are fame-centered. I want to be famous. Some people are power-centered. I want to be powerful, manager, general manager, CEO, minister, power-centered. Some people are pleasure-centered. I want to get pleasure. That's it. Nothing else in life. Some people, they are workaholic. Workaholic, they want to work, that's it. All these different categories of people are not the right type. The best center is which center? The best center is Allah center. And when you speak about Allah centered, it doesn't mean you're neglecting other things. Allah centered includes everything in the right proportion, following the goals of Islamic. When you're Allah centered doesn't mean that you're selfless, that you don't take care of yourself. In the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sahih Bukhari volume 3, hadith number 1975, the Prophet told to Abdullah that I've heard that you fast every day and that you pray the full night. He said, Ya Rasulullah, yes, O Prophet of Allah. The Prophet told him, fast one day, do not fast the other. Pray some part of the night, sleep the other part of the night. Your body has a right over you. Your wife has a right over you. Your guests have a right over you. That means, yes, you should take care of you. You cannot say that I am selfless completely. Fast, don't fast. Pray some part of the night, sleep some part. Because your body has a right over you, that means you should take care of your body. You should take care of yourself. Don't be self-centered, but take care of yourself. Take care of your wife. Take care of your guests. Our beloved Prophet Sallallahu said, Sayyid Hadith Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Hadith number 7396, the best believer is that who is the best to his family. Taking care of your family is the best Muslim. Not that you have to be parent-centered that to tell you to do against Allah and His Rasul, but take care of your parents, you have to, it's a fard. Take care of your wife. The best believer is that who is the best to his wife. Hadith of the Prophet. The most happy person, the beloved Prophet said, is the one who has a good wife. All the hadith. That means when you are Allah centered, you should take care of your parents, take care of your wife, love your wife, 
take care of your children children are a test for you take care of your neighbor in surah maun chapter number 107 that take care of the neighbor and happy person is that who also has a good neighbor it is including everything allah centered have good friends who will take you close to allah and his rasul talking about society material things spend in the way of allah you have to give zakat so if you are allah centered it is the best and the best example of a human being who's the best allah centered is the last and final messenger muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anbiya chapter number 21 verse number 107 وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the worlds as a mercy to all the creatures as a mercy to all the human beings and not only is he respected by the Muslims even the non-Muslims agree and you can give a talk on what the non-Muslims speak about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we know if you read the writings of La Martin who was a famous French historian who wrote on the history of the Turks and he writes that if smallness of means smallness of means greatness of purpose and astounding results are the three criteria to judge a human being there is no one who can come close to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. smallness of means what means did he have the greatness of purpose changing the whole of humanity an astounding result the maximum the most famous person in the world is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam La Martin a non-Muslim says there is no human being who can come close to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him if you read the book the hundred most influential people in the world by Michael H. Hart a non-Muslim he gives examples and in his list of hundred he mentions about Aristotle about Ahsoka about Christ about Buddha about Confucius about Zoroaster and number one he places is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he says, many would be surprised at my choice. Many would argue with me at my decision. But there is no man who's closed and successful. There is no man who has been so successful in the religious and secular life as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. George Bernard Shaw, he writes that I studied this man, Muhammad, more, more than he being called an antichrist, I would say he is the savior for humanity. If you read the book, by Thomas Carlyle, Hero and Hero Worship. He writes an essay on Hero as a prophet. And he doesn't choose David, Moses, Jesus, peace be upon them. He chooses Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his hero prophet. And the list can go on. Allah says clearly in Surah Kalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, that verily in the prophet you will find a sublime and exalted character. Allah says in Surah Azab and Surah Zumur, chapter number 33, verse number 21, that verily in the Prophet you will find the most beautiful pattern of conduct. He's the best example. We have several examples in Islamic history. We have the example of the Khulfa Rashidin, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. May Allah be pleased with him. Hazrat Umar al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. Hazrat Usman bin Affan, may Allah be pleased with him. Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. The four Khulfa Rashidin, the Asha Mubashirin. Besides the four Khulfa Rashidin, you have the other six Sahabas. After Abu Bakr, uh, Siddiq, Hazrat Umar, uh, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. You have the Sahaba, the six Sahaba, Talha. You have Zubair. You have Abdurrahman bin Auf. You have Saad bin Waqqas. You have uh, Sayyid bin Zaid, you have Abu Jarra, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarra. May Allah be pleased with them all. These ten Asha Mubashirin, if you see their lifestyle, they are an example for the Muslims. You have the example of the four, of the four great women. Allah says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 42, Allah says, وَإِسْكَالَ مَلَائِكَةُ وَمَرْيَمَ Behold the angel said, O Mary, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاكِ وَطَحَارَكِ وَاسْتَفَاكِ وَاسْتَفَاكِ that Allah has chosen thee and purified thee and chosen thee above the women of all nations. Allah is calling Mother Mary. May Allah be pleased with her. As the woman above all nations. Allah talks about Asya, the wife of the Prophet in Surah Tahrim, chapter number 66, verse number 11. That she prays to Allah that I want a mansion close to Allah in Jannah 
and save me from Pharaoh. That means she's asking in exchange. She was the wife of the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh. The most wealthiest man. She prays to Allah, I want a house, a mansion in Jannah close to you in exchange for the wealth and the power of this world. You have the example of wife of the Prophet Khadija, may Allah be peace with her. You have the example of Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You have the example of Aisha Radhiallahu Anha. Several women. All these are examples for us. If you see the lifestyle and you see the goal setting in the lifestyle, they are exemplary. And we pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that may He. Make us close to these exemplary people. These are our heroes. These are our heroines. Not what you see in the film industry. These are all artificial. And before I end my talk, I'd like to ask you a question. That whenever I take interview of parents when they take admission into our school, I ask them the question and I'm asking that question to you also. When you want to upbring your children, when you want to bring your children, when Islamically, when is the latest that you think about their future? Latest, not earliest. When is the latest will you think, oh, no, this is the time that I have to think about the future of my child? When? What age? When? Can anyone guess? Latest or not the earliest? When? When you want to bring your child, when will the latest you think? When? Don't think at all. When they die. When will you think the latest? Any answers? About when you want to think about the future of your child, when is the latest you will think Islamically? Okay, this is the last time I have to. When? You don't want to think about your children. Huh? When? When you put them in university? Sorry? After they finish their studies, you'll think about the future. Can anyone improve on that? After they finish their studies, you'll think about the future of the child. When? Among the ladies, among the sisters, when would you want to think about the future of your children? When they pass the university or before they pass the university? Yes, anyone? Anyone? Some tell that when they pass the university, some say before they enter the university, some say that before they pass the standard 10, before they finish the school, some say when we want to ad admit them in school, that's the latest we have to think about the future. One person told me before I give this lecture, after I gave the lecture, many people have heard on the net. They told me when, the, when my child is born, that's the time I'll think of his future. The right Islamic answer is the latest you'll think about the bringing of a children is when you choose your life partner. When you choose your life partner is the time that latest you have to think because the mother of the child is the best teacher. If you want your child to be Islamic, then you'll choose the Islamic life partner. If you want him to be an actor, then you will try and marry an actor. So the latest you have to think, you can think earlier, the latest is when you choose your life partner. You have to plan about the children. We school after that. Because when you marry, that time you know what type of children you want to bring? If the tuning of you, you and your wife are the same, you know Allah says in the Quran that the women are mohsana. They are, are a, they are a fortress against the devil for you. For the men, the woman is a mohsana, a fortress against the devil. They will keep you again away from the evil thing. They will keep your children away from the evil thing if they are a true Muslim. Then you have to see to it that you give them a good education. Put them in a school which has education for both the worlds, for deen and dunya both, not only dunya. See to it they have good friends. See to it that they join good Islamic organizations. 
see to it that they have good companions see to see to it that they have got good role models all this is very important for goal setting now i'd like to end my speech with the verse of the glorious quran from surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 162 which says inna salati wa nusuki wa ma yahya ma tilla bil alamin that verily my life my sacrifice and my prayers are for allah alone the cherisher of the world wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillah bil alamin Good evening, Mr. Zakir. I'm Jay Sivins, a student from this university. Non Muslim, five times daily, Muslims gather together to perform their daily prayer. I should say that Islam is a very peaceful religion that promotes unity. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, even among Muslims, unity is not something that is cheap. So, as a Muslim, I practice what are the things that you can suggest to every Muslims in this country to stay night. Thank you. Thank you. The brother has said that Muslims pray five times a day, that's good. He's asking, can I suggest something that will keep the Muslims united? And I'm giving a talk tomorrow, the importance of the unity in the Muslim Ummah. And that's the full-fledged lecture. But the reply to your question is, Allah gives the reply in the glorious Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, which says that, Wa tasimu wala Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. The rope of Allah, it is the glorious Quran. That the Muslims should hold together to the rope of Allah, the glorious Quran, and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and be not divided. The only factor that Muslim not only of Malaysia but the Muslim of the whole world can be united is on the basis of the glorious Quran which is the last and final revelation and the authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hold together strongly and be not divided that is the best uniting factor hope that answers the question thank you Mr. Zaki thank you for your question I would like to request all the people who like to ask questions to form a queue so that it will uh, ensure the smoothness of this question and answer session. Now we will move to the mic on my left from the Muslimin. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. My name is Uwais bin Sha'ari and uh, I am a student from. UUM and I take Islamic finance and banking. My question is, as we know, uh, Prophet Adam is the first human being on earth. But before uh, Prophet Adam uh, is created, is there another creature that uh, live in, on earth before Prophet Adam Salam? Thank you. I think the chairperson was very clear that please pose question on the topic. What has the question got to do with the topic? What is the purpose of our life? The topic of today's talk is what is the purpose of life? I can give the reply to your question. I don't mind giving. But the chairperson said that question should be asked on the topic. Otherwise it becomes an open. So please ask question on the topic. What is the purpose of life? So we'll be limited to the topic. Thank you. And all those who like to ask a question, can they please queue, queue behind the four microphones so that we save time? And even the sisters, if they can queue behind the microphone so that we can go to the next question faster. Any sisters behind would like to ask a question? Any sisters from the microphone behind? MashaAllah, the sisters have understood the lecture very well. Either very well or nothing, one of the two. Yes, can we have the question from the sister? Can we get the question from the sister right at the back on my left? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Rosita Abdullah. I'm a teacher and um, mother. I would like to ask uh, one question. Uh, during the golden age that we know, our scholar is a um, master in the both uh, like Islamic studies and the science. But uh, now uh, we found out that like in Malaysia especially, our system education is like separately between science and Islamic study. So if the student like um, like our um, like our student want to choose which one is the best is it islamic studies or uh, science because we know that uh, now uh, we still need a, a dai from the uh, uh, science area because we, we know that the knowledge is already expand very fast so uh, for uh, our youngest and our student which one is the best that we can choose either Islamic studies or engineering or medical or success so I would like you to advise and then if we choose uh, like science area how we can be a good a success dime shukran this is also a good question and a very relevant question that she's the teacher and she's the mother and she asks that what should we choose between the two? Should we make our children and study the Islamic teachings in the Islamic schools or in the science and technology field? Which is better of the two? And the reply to this question, which is very commonly asked, in the year 2000, Alhamdulillah, about 18 years back, we started a school in Bombay by the name of Islamic International School. And the main motto, brother, can you? Yes. Close to the microphone, yes, so that we can. And the motto of the school was education for both the worlds. That means education for deen and dunya both. And that is the best. Education for both the worlds is the best. Because when a person knows the value and is educated by the worldly thing and then studies deen simultaneously he can understand deen better the best is education for both the worlds and in our school we used to teach Arabic from the age of three from nursery itself we used to teach Arabic and English then they read the Quran one third of them become half of the Quran by the time they reach standard five they half of the Quran mashallah but we select about one third students by the time they reach standard five girl or boy has to be black belt in taekwondo and karate compulsory if the child is weak he becomes black belt or she becomes black belt in standard six compulsory swimming compulsory we used to teach public speaking at the age of first standard from the age of six they start public speaking arabic public speaking from second and third standard we used to teach them besides quran hadith sharia fiqh along with the science we used to teach Islamic studies and Arabic. When we taught them science, we used to incorporate 25% of the Islamic teachings in science. For example, when we spoke about the Big Bang, that you know, we learn in science about the Big Bang, that first there was a primary nebula, a whole universe was a primary nebula, then there was a secondary separation, which gave rise to stars, galaxies, and the earth we live in. We say this, Allah says 1400 years ago. What they discovered today, recently in 1973, Allah says 1400 years back in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yaral zina kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan tarat kan faftak nauma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. So we tell them what the scientists got Nobel Prize 50 years back. Our beloved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the Quran 1400 years ago. When we talk about water cycle, we give examples of the Quran water cycle. When we talk about geology, biology, zoology, we talk about embryology, the child is empowered. Okay, my deen is more powerful than science what is today. What we learn today is already mentioned in our religious scriptures 14 years ago. So the child is proud to be a Muslim. The best is education for both the worlds. And when we find that certain things are which are against the Islamic teaching. For example, Darwin's theory. How do human beings were formed? 
we give them the scientific proof that what Darwin said that we are evolved from ape is wrong and we give them scientific basis we teach them repeat what is mentioned in the textbook but give them additional information so we repeat what is mentioned in the textbook but we say according to P.P. Grasse this is wrong according to so and so scientists then we give the list of scientists so we train them in the syllabus and when they pass they don't get a degree from India or Muslim University they get from Cambridge Board Oxford Direct Cambridge, IGCSE. And once they pass, they can get admission anywhere in the world. So we have an amalgamation of the formal education with the Islamic education, Quran, Hadith, Sharia, Fiqh, and Dawa. Besides Quran, we teach them about the Bible, we teach them about Hindu scriptures, about comparative religion. Our children can speak, mashallah. So at the same time, they are trained. And our first batch, the first batch of a school, the first batch was passed in 2010, about eight years back. And the girl which came out first from her school, out of five subjects, four subjects, she got 100 out of 100. She topped. She was a world topper. A Muslim wearing hijab, black belt in Taekwondo and Karate, knowing Arabic as the language, Hafiz ul Quran, knowing swimming, mashallah. She topped. She topped the world. So this is education for both the worlds. And this is the best concept. I didn't have time to expand towards the end of my talk because normally I speak for one or 15 minutes and my talk extended to one and a half hour. So I cut short my speech. It's important. Education for both the worlds is very important. But if you ask me the question, which is better of the two? Best is both. But if the science you learn in your school, in your colleges, in your university does not get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that science is useless. So many a times our children go to the Western University and instead of becoming closer to Allah, they become atheist because they are taught wrong things. So you have to be careful when we put them into the so-called secular education. It's not haram, it's good, but you have to be careful. Best is a striking balance between the two. And I know there are many people who are asking me to build such a school in Malaysia and believe me to make a school is too time consuming because of my other projects but if Allah wills inshallah we should have a school in which when the child comes out we should be proud of our children at the same time we teach them business studies we teach them ICT so best is and when he passes from the school like a normal mother of when a person becomes an alim if you compare our student inshallah they will be able to be better they speak Arabic fluently all my three children, my son, mashallah, is black belt in Taekwondo, Hafiz al Quran, speaks Arabic fluently. Both my daughters, they are black belt, they are good swimmers, mashallah. And, and mashallah, Hafiz al Quran, the Arabic is fluent. Now, all three of them now studying in Jamit al Imam. My son is in Jamit al Imam, and my daughter in Jamit al Nura in Riyadh. Jamit al Imam, according to me, is one of the best Islamic universities in the world in terms of Islamic knowledge in Arabic. And they speak Loga Fusa. So, best is. Put them in a school which has the striking balance between the two. The Islamic education and the formal education. I don't say secular, I say formal. And teach them the Islamic values. They will grow up to be like proud Muslims. This is the best. If you don't have an alternative, then I know there are schools, Islamic schools in Malaysia. May not be up to the standard that what we have in Bombay. But there are Islamic schools. What we should do, we should guide these people and see to it that the Islamic value increases and best is to put in Islamic school which has education for the both and at the same time we should make our children the role models should be the people I named in my lecture some are at the time of the Prophet some are the Sahaba, some next generation we have in the middle generation we have in this generation and we teach them the skills of public speaking about lecturing about debating and we want that 50% of our school children should go in the mainstream become doctors engineers scientists but then when they when they become doctors they have knowledge of Quran and Sunnah when they become engineers they have knowledge of Quran and Sunnah and 50% should go Islamic field Dais, Islamic teachers Shiuks, Ufasri, Muhaddisin so this was the purpose and you know when we get success, the enemies of Islam are against you. So you know that because of Allah's help, the success we got in India and in our field, 
the enemies of Islam were against and the Indian government wanted to school, wanted to close our school. Alhamdulillah, we were able to give to some of the Muslim brothers. They may not be running the school to the same level, but yet the, yet the school is continuing. Inshallah, if Allah wills and if time permits, we should have such schools in all over the world, including Malaysia and including Perlis also. Hope that answers the question. But between the two sisters, please, if the choice between Islamic and science, I would give more importance to Islamic. But give Islam part of Islamic, which has, if not completely, <clears throat> at least part of modern education. Because be sure that the Islamic education would be for Akhira. And your children will also get dunya. If you could put to a normal school. See, I'm coming from a normal convent school. I thank Allah that he made me a dai. That doesn't mean I went to a convent school, all should go to convent school. It was Allah's help that even though he went to a convent school, I'm a doctor by profession. Allah gave me hidayah. I became a doctor because I thought it was the most noble profession, treating human beings. It is noble. But when I found a nobler profession of a dai, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحَسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ دَوَيْ لَلَّهِ وَعَمِلُ صَالِحَوْ قَالَ إِنَّ لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim. And if you have that purpose of life, education is not main. It is your mission. Sheikh Didad, six standard pass. And he reached the pinnacle. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he guide us and guide our children and guide the Muslim Ummah to achieve the purpose of our life. Hope that answers the question. All right. Thank you. I would like to check. I would like to check, is there any questioner on the mic behind for the Muslimah? No. Okay, once again, I would like to reinstate that please ask questions related to the topic of tonight, which is, what is the purpose of life? Okay? So, we're moving on to the mic right in front of me, from the brother. Please state your name and also your profession. And your question, make it brief so that we can have more time for others to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Very uh, thanks to Dr. Zakir Naik for your excellent talks on the uh, purpose of life. Uh, myself, uh, Razul, uh, I'm a medical doctor. Um, my question is about the purpose of life, meaning we have to follow all the words in the Quran. And one of the important words in the Quran told to us by Allah SWT is to follow their, the law that has been designed to the humankind. In the law of uh, law. Islamic law that has been, has been designed to the humankind. So in the Islamic law, as you know, we have uh, you know, hudud, we have uh, qisas, and we have uh, all these things. But simply in current present time, we have no problem, problem to practice all the laws. So as a Muslim and in conjunction with the purpose of life, how are we going to practice with all the ayah in the Al-Quran? Well, that's the question that if you are Muslim, you want to achieve the purpose of life, you have to follow the Quran. There's the Islamic law, there's law of hudud, how do we practice it? Brother, in the Quran, there are some guidelines which every individual Muslim should do and some are guidelines of society. First, you have to see to it that are you following the guidelines what Allah has told to an individual Muslim? Praying, believing in Tawheed, fasting, giving zakat, all these are individuals. Regarding the law of hudud, this is about government laws. Allah will not ask you and me who are not involved in the government that whether you practice the hudud or not. That hudud law is only for an Islamic society completely. If you have, then you have to follow. As an individual Muslim, first you have to see all those laws which you as an individual human being are following or not. There are some laws which are punishment. It is not required for every individual Muslim to give punishment to the other Muslim. That's only required by the Islamic authorities. And that is not to be followed in every country, only if the country in which the Muslims are in majority, or in total majority, or whatever you can. But if the country is in majority, yes, you should strive to achieve that level. But as an individual Muslim, you and I, First, we have to follow that which is the commandment to an individual human being in some aspect. Those which are societal, 
you should try and improve the society. That doesn't mean you should not try and implement, implement the Islamic Sharia. So yes, you should try. But Allah will not question you as an individual. Allah will question you on the individual things. But if you ask me, which is the best law to be followed so that you have the maximum peace, it is the law of the Quran. The best time was at the time of the Prophet Muhammad and the Khulfa Rashidi. The least rate of robbery, least rate of rape, the maximum peace was at the time of the Khulfa Rashidi. So if someone wants to implement on a government level, this is the best. But it has to be done in stages. You cannot implement everything if all are not Muslims. If all are Muslims, easy. If more than 95% of the people are Muslim, it's easy. Yet, you have many countries in the world which are more than 95, yet they don't implement. Because all the Muslims may not be Islamic. But, but naturally, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best. There's no better law than, than the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that's the question. Okay. Thank you. Now, we are moving on to the mic on my right. Please, brother, state your name and your profession and your question in brief. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. My name is Muhammad Hashim bin Muhammad Zain, student of Faculty of Applied Science from UITM Perlis. My question is, to, purpose, to fulfill our purpose of life, we are following this religion. But also Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse 120, and also, uh, Prophet also warned us in his last sermon in Arafah. He said that Shaitan have given hope in leaders doing astray. So don't follow him in small matters. My question is about those rumors and theory. Do you believe that there is a world-class organization who are trying to make us deflect from our real purpose of life by using such entertainment, sport, and songs called Illuminati. Thank you, sir. Do you believe it is? Exists or not? Thank you, sir. Brother asked a question, and he said, Allah says that the Satan is trying to divert you. He said, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 120, didn't, he gave the reference but didn't quote the verse. So the Bakra chapter 2 verse 120 says, Walan tarda ankal Yahudu, walan nasar hata tata bil milatiyum. That the Jews and the Christians will never be satisfied until you follow their way of life. I don't know whether he meant this verse or some other word, but so the Bakra chapter 2 verse 110 is, Walan tarda yankal Yahudu, walan nasar hata tata bil milatiyum. That the Jews and Christians will never be satisfied until you follow their way of life. His question is that do you believe that there are some organizations that are trying to divert the human beings into things which will take you away from the deen like music and and movies or whatever it is or Hayashi etc. And what's my comment about Illuminati? If you ask me, there are organizers divert, there are organizations diverting you, 100% there are many. Regarding Illuminati, I have heard of it. I have not done much research, but I do agree that there are many organizations and many people working to divert the people away from our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it be politically, whether it be materially, whether it be educationally. Therefore, you have to be careful. And I say that we as Muslims should be careful that we should stick to the Quran and Sunnah. If we stick to the Quran and Sunnah, we will find that we will achieve the purpose of our life. There are many organizations in education. In education, whether it be science, whether it be technology, whether it be entertainment. They create whether it be Hollywood, whether it be Disney World. If you know the background, they create all this cartoon. Cartoon, Tom and Jerry, no problem. But Tom and Jerry, they're teaching you, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend. They're teaching you from young age. What harm? What harm in my son watching Tom Jerry? Tom and Jerry, what harm? They're inculcating in your small child of the age of four, five, six, girlfriend, boyfriend. So when he grows old, girlfriend, boyfriend. Against Islamic teaching. They teach about homosexuality. So we have to be careful. That's the reason. What we do, the sister asked the question. We Islamize. Though we take the syllabus of Cambridge, we have got training session for our teachers. Five days is school for the children. For the teachers, they come six days. One day is to inculcate the Islamic aspects in your science, in your mathematics, in your history, in your geography. 
we go through the full syllabus we have teachers trainer our teacher student ratio you know how much for every one for every one teacher there is about two and a half students for every staff for every for every two staff there are three students for every two staff three students 200 student 150 staff this is our ratio when our teachers teach him one kari teaches only two students you know when we go to these schools you know these international schools they have music classes full with completely with soundproof glasses so that when they teach the voice doesn't go out what we do we have got his class his cabin his cabin soundproof made of glass so that when you recite loudly your partner doesn't get disturbed we take the idea but implement for the cause of Allah what we have to be we have to be careful of this education of this entertainment of these movies you know according to survey on an average on an average a child of the age of seven or eight first time goes to a pornographic site how because through these cartoons it diverts to pornographic site I've given a separate lecture on this topic time will not permit me I have not completed so you have to be careful what you want to call them forget it let's not go into names whether Illuminati whether it is this or whether it but there is a big movement we as Muslim should be careful our guidelines is the Quran and Sunnah and we have to be careful that anything we divert you from Allah and His Rasul we have to be away from that and we have people trying to you know make it and we feel everything is modern yes being modern is no problem but if that modern takes you away from Allah and His Rasul then stay away from it so we have to be careful when we check pick up the good things of the non-Muslim no problem but be careful don't get trapped and go away from your deen that is the reason our Prophet Muhammad said that towards Kama you will have many number of Muslims but they will be like froth no value today Muslims are 25% of the world but what is the value at the time of the Prophet from the 8th to the 10th century Muslims on top of the world if you wanted to learn science you had to learn Arabic the father of chemistry Jabir, they call Gebar, Gebar is Jabir ibn Nahyan who distilled alcohol alcohol comes from the English word alcohol, from the Arabic word al -Ghul. at a time when people when before Einstein spoke about the theory of relativity it was the Muslim scholars trigonometry biloptrisy the person who taught the zero was a Muslim you can give a lecture only on the development of science done by the Muslim because we were on top of the world at that time we were close to Quran and Sunnah because they're close to Quran and Sunnah the advances we did in science was excellent today we Muslims are away from Quran and Sunnah because we're away from Quran and Sunnah we are at the bottom today you know we are being hammered everywhere you see in the world we are being criticized we are being tortured we are being killed and we are no force we should be united on the base of Quran and Sunnah and see to it that we teach our children and our generation to become close to Quran and Sunnah hope that answers the question Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Before we move on to the next questioner, I would like to ask, is there any other non-Muslims in the crowd that would like to ask questions? Is there any other non-Muslims in the crowd that would like to ask the question? No. Okay. Fine. I would like to move on to the sister at the back to my left. Is there any questioner there? Okay, sure. Sister, please state your name, your profession, and make your question brief. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Siti Nur Amira binti Muhammad Yusuf. I am a student of Diploma in Science. So my question is, uh, in my journey to get Allah's pleasure and to get my purpose to get in, straight into Jannah, I have found two paths in my life, which is, uh, which is Sunni and Wahhabi. So, can you briefly explain to me what is the difference between Sunni and Wahhabi so I will get clear of these two matters. Thank you. This asks the question that in the journey to purpose of life, you know, you can pose a question and make it on the topic by putting the topic in your question. <laughs> All this is, any question the sister wants to know, her main question is, she wants to know what is the difference between Sunni and Wahhabi. 
Sister, if you read the Quran, there is no word as Sunni or Wahhabi in the Quran. There is no word called Sunni and Wahhabi. Yes. One of the attributes of Allah is Wahhab. He's loving. We all should be Abdul Wahhab. Should be servant of Allah. Servant of the attribute of Allah's love. And Sunnah means, Sunni means following the Sunnah of the Prophet. So every Muslim in that context should follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. So Sunni means following the Sunnah of the Prophet. Every Muslim should be a Sunni. If he's not a Muslim, if he's not a Sunni, then he's not a practicing Muslim. This is the literal meaning of the Sunni. Wahhabi means if you if you believe in Allah, every Muslim should be Wahhabi. But what the world called about Sunni and Wahhabi, different countries have different label. In my country, Sunni has a different label. In this country, Sunni has a different meaning. But the word Sunni means following Sunnah. Every Muslim should follow Sunnah. Wahhab is the attribute of Allah. We should love. If you say Abdul Wahhab, every Muslim should be Abdul Wahhab. Should be servant. In short, sister, your purpose of life should be to follow Allah and His Rasul. I told the Islamic girl, I, Islamic. Allah and His Rasul. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 59, Atiullah or Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And those who are Alul Umr, with those who have the knowledge, Allah has bestowed the power of knowledge. Means the ulamas. But the world doesn't end there. If the ulamas, if the scholars differ, go back to Allah and His Rasul. So if the scholars, all the scholars say, pray, you pray five times, you pray five times, no problem. Give the card, give the card, 2.5, 2.5. If they differ, go back to Allah and His Rasul, check with Quran and say Hadith, which is correct. The problem is, the problem is what you know. In India, when first time automobiles came in India, People didn't know how to drive the car. So the company we sold the car, when you purchase the car, the company also gave the driver along with the car. I'm talking about, you know, 100 years back. So one, one rich businessman, he buys a car. And along with the car, the company gives the driver. So one day, the businessman tells, driver, get the car ready, I want to take my wife for shopping. So driver says, sir, the car is not in working order. How come? Get the car immediately in working order. So the driver said, to put the car in working order, I require 10 kgs of honey, 20 kgs of rice, basmati rice, 30 liters of milk, and 40 kgs of honey. So the rich businessman gives him the 10 kg of ghee, 20 liters of milk, basmati rice, and honey. And the car is in working condition. This time asking me the question. If your driver today tells you that I want honey, ghee, basmati rice, and milk to keep the car in working condition, will you give him? Will you give him yes or no? I can fix the car. I will not give the... I'm not asking you to fix the car. I'm asking you the question. If the driver asks you to put the car in working condition, I require basmati rice. I require ghee, I require honey, I require milk. Will you give him? Of course. Of course, yes. Yes, I will give because uh, that, uh, that's the way to fix the car, to get the car work. Mashallah. Which age are you living in, sister? Which university are you studying in? What? Which university are you studying in? UITM. UITM? This university? I'm asking your rector, okay. I'm asking your rector now. Sir, if your driver says, give me milk, give me honey, give me ghee, give me rice to put the car in working condition, will you give him? You will, what do you do? You will suck him off the job, correct? If the driver of this university says, I want ghee, I want rice, I want milk, your rector is saying he will suck him out of the job, you will give him. So the problem is, sister, if you don't know the basics of car, you are studying in university, that the car doesn't require rice, doesn't require ghee, ah. doesn't require milk. Okay, I get it now, sir. Oh, very good, very intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, it was... Today, maybe the sound system is not good and you could not hear. I was talking about the car. Okay. Car, car. Any car, Toyota. 
परडा ना मुझ पे जब का पेरुडुआ प्रोटॉन एनी का इवन प्रोटॉन डजन वर्क ऑन घी राइस सो टुडे इफ यू टेल अ पर्सन इफ द ड्राइवर सेज गिव मी घी राइस एंड हनी यू विल किक हिम आउट ऑफ द जॉब बिकॉज़ इवन इफ यू डोंट नो हाउ टू रिपेयर द कार वी नो वेरी वेल दैट द कार डज नॉट वर्क ऑन मिल्क हनी इट वर्क्स ऑन पेट्रोल एंड डीजल करेक्ट so similarly today muslim today sister if we know if we know the basic teachings of quran and the hadith no one will take you for a ride so if you know the basic teachings of quran read the quran with translation read the translation of the hadith in the language you understand the best whether it be english whether it be bahasa whether it be male if you understand people will not take you for a ride and if the car is really spoiled you take to a mechanic then you can ask an expert So we as Muslims should follow Allah and His Rasul, follow Quran and the Sahih Hadith. There are scholars. If the scholars differ, go back to Allah and His Rasul. Allah says in the Quran, I said in my talk, in the answer before Surah Fusila, chapter forty-one, verse number thirty-three. Waman ahsanu kalla min man doi la Allah wa amal salihau kalla inna nimla Muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of the Lord? Works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim. The best label you can give yourself is Muslim. Call a inna ni min al Muslimin. Say that I am a Muslim. So the best label any Muslim can give himself, Allah calls you is Muslim. You have to follow Quran and say it. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Now moving on. Do we have a question from the sister to my right? No question. Okay, we will move on to the questioner on the mic in front of me. Assalamualaikum. Please state your name. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Muhammad Shami, and I'm an engineering student of Unimap. And I just want to ask one question uh, for you, Doctor Zakinek, regarding our akidah, which is uh, believing that Allah is in Arash, uh, staying in Arash. Uh, some of our Muslim. Uh, Believing that Allah is everywhere, what is what will happen to their akidah if they are believing in this kind of way? Uh, even though that the Quran saying that Allah is at the arsh, that's all. But if you read the Quran, the Quran is very clear that Allah is on His throne. It's very clear cut, and the throne extends to the heavens and the earth. We should not put our own words in the attributes of Allah. The best way, therefore, to describe Allah the way He has described Himself and the way the Prophet has described. We should not put our own words and own understanding. The best akhida is describe Allah the way He has described Himself and the way the Prophet has done. You should not add anything or delete anything from that. What the Quran says, repeat that verse, and that is the best. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Now we would like to move on to the mic on my left. Brother, please state your name, your profession, and make your question brief. Tasdeen. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nadrin Ghazali. I'm from planting in industry management and agri agro technology from UITM Arau. Okay, my question is: uh, the purpose of life as a Muslim is to serve Allah with all our might. And the branches from it is uh, to fight for our religion when it's come, uh, when it's uh, when the need is uh, come to us. So the question is, how come we, the young, the student, want to contribute in this fight for Islam in order to uh, in order to fulfil our purpose as a Muslim in our life? Thank you. Thank you. The brother asked the question that the purpose in life is seeking the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and we have to fight for our religion. How, do, as the students, can do to fight for our religion? Number one, fight the devil in you. Number one, jihad fi nafs. Yes. The biggest fight is fighting against your nafs. Yeah. The devil, which is in us, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the devil flows in the veins of the human being like the blood flows in the human being. The number one fight is fight against our nafs. Oh, you want to do these wrong things? You want to do zina? Okay, stop it. You want to do things which are wrong? So best for fighting for any human being, for any Muslim, is fight the devil in us. 
and then follow the Quran and Sunnah. And we have to strive. The best is jihad. The right word is not fight, it is jihad. Jihad means to strive and struggle. To strive and struggle to make the society better. To strive and struggle to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. So we should see to it that we reach a higher level. One first you do the Faraiz, then you do the Sunnah the Mokhida, then do the Sunnah the Gaur Mokhida. You keep on striving to reach a higher level. Praying five times, okay, praying five times in the, in the mosque, then see to it that you read the Sunnah the Mokhida 12, then you read Tahajjud. All these keep on striving, striving to reach a better level, whether it be in Salah, whether it be in charity, okay, fine, minimum charity is Zakat, 2.5%. Then, okay, I will give 10% of my earnings. I want to give 20% of my earnings. I want to give 30%. The more you give charity, better for you. The more you fast, okay, minimum fasting is fasting in the month of Ramadan. Okay, then I want to fast of the Muharram, then the fast of Ashura, then the 10 days of Zilhajjah. Then you want to do Shawwal fasting. Then you want to do Ayam will be Every time you can keep on going closer and closer first to the Faraiz, then keep on doing as much as Sunnah possible. This is the best for you to achieve the objective and reach the goal that is Jannah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Now we are moving on to the sister to my left, the behind. Please state your name, your profession, and also the question briefly. Thank you. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shafika binti Muhammad Zamri. Can you speak am, louder, sister? Sorry. My name is Shafika binti Muhammad Zamri. I am uh, an accounting student from Perlis Matriculation College. Um, you said earlier that human being engines are the only creation that can choose whether to obey or disobey Allah so from what I know Allah has set the destiny for each one of us uh, whether we are going to end up in the hellfire or the heaven um, and we always hear that everything happens for a reason so if everything has planned then what is the point of obeying the rules Sister, that's a very, very relevant question, very good question, and a common question asked about Qadr. That if everything is destined that when we are going to hell or heaven, everything is mentioned in the Qadr, so where is the question of the test? Correct, sister. If everything is mentioned or already mentioned that I'm going to rob, and if my Qadr says I'm going to rob and I rob, so why am I to blame? Allah is to blame. And this is the question which is asked. The reply to this is that I would like to give an example that in, in a classroom a teacher teaches the student at the end of the year after teaching before the examination the teacher predicts that this student he'll come out first class first this student will come out second class this student he will fail and the examination takes place this student comes first class first this student gets second class that student fails the student who fails can he tell the teacher, because you predicted I will fail, I failed? Can he blame the teacher? Can the student who failed blame the teacher that because you predicted I will fail, I failed? Can he blame the teacher? No. Why the teacher knows this student is very studious, does his homework very well, attends all the classes, will come out first class first, this student average second class, this student, he bungs the class, plays hookies, Goes for movies, doesn't just uh, just an example. Don't get angry. <laughs> so just because the teacher predicted he will fail, he cannot blame and say because the teacher predicted I failed, because the teacher knew that he does not do the homework. Now the difference between Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, Allah is ilm gair. He has knowledge of the future. And it is not because Allah has written that you are doing. Allah knows in advance what you will be doing and you have done it. For example, if you come at a crossroad, you can either choose road 1, 2, 3, 4. You choose road 2. Allah knows in advance that on the 2nd of December, you will come at a crossroad. You have four choices, 1, 2, 3, 4. You will choose road 2. So not because Allah says you are choosing road 2. Because you will be choosing road 2, Allah writes in advance. Once you pass a university, you know that you can work honestly or you can rob dishonestly. You choose to rob. Who's to blame? Allah or you? You are to blame. But Allah knows in advance that once you finish your university, you had the option of becoming a good, honest 
person or robbing you choose to rob so it is not because Allah has written your doing because you will be doing Allah rights in advance Allah is in my gap the teacher is mostly correct but can make a mistake because she is a human being or he's a human being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in my gap he has knowledge of the future he knows in advance so he writes it in advance that is the reason Allah my Iqbal a very great Islamic poet said that khudi ko kar itna buland ke har takdeer ke pehle khuda apne bande se khud puche bata tari raza kya hai it's a urdu couplet which says that make yourself so great that Allah before writing the destiny asks his servant that what do you want and I will make you that it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of the future Allah has given you the option that you can do something honestly you can do dishonestly you choose to do to do it dishonestly so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he has in my gap he writes in advance but who's to blame for the dishonesty you Allah who's to blame the human being Allah gave you the choice the choice was yours Allah told you don't cheat don't drop but you rob who's to blame you so this is talking about the Qadr that Allah has written the Qadr but you make the choice therefore you are responsible and, and not Allah hope that answers the question sister due to the limited time that we have we can only take the last two questions and I will take the question from the sisters the sister behind and also followed by the brother in front of me on the front in front of me I'm sorry for the um, those people who like to ask questions, I'm afraid that we are unable to take your questions for this time. Okay, Dr. Zaki Naik has requested for one more last round. So we will go on from that sister at the back, followed by this brother at the front, this brother on my left, and also a last questioner from the sister behind, if they have. Okay, now we move on to our sister. Uh, please state your name, your profession, and also the question that you have. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Nahida bin Tahir. I am a medical graduate from Cairo University. So my question is um, regarding the purpose of life that you are to call to people to good and nahiyan al munkar and to um, da'wah basically. Um, you, we're quite familiar with la ikraha fid din, the verse la ikraha fid din and it never really sits with me well that apostasy is to be executed. So can you briefly explain on that in if, if there is similar um, rulings in other religions? Sister, can you repeat the question again? Uh, apostasy? Uh, sister, can you uh, ask a question that is relevant to the topic? My question is regarding that because people have asked me that and to like Christians when I want to keep call people to Islam and it's like I, um, I can't really I don't really know what to say about that one. I'm sorry sister uh, it's not relevant to the topic. Which... Thank you. There's an answer on the YouTube of Dr. Zakir Naid that you can find the answer there. Inshallah you can view it there inshallah. Now moving on to our brother in front of me. Please state your name your profession and also your question briefly. Yes, okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good night to everyone. Uh, my name is Noor Ahmad Ikmal bin Nordin and I'm, I am a student from Perlis Matriculation College or College Matriculacy Perlis. Okay, uh, my question is uh, if we have been given two choice which is compulsory um, catching our dreams or fulfilling our purpose or responsibilities which is what which one is more better thank you thank you if I heard the question correctly that if you have a choice of fulfilling your dream or fulfilling your purpose which is more important uh, yes unless you don't tell me what is your dream and what is your purpose I cannot say which is important <laughs> fine so if you tell me what the, if your dream is close to Quran and Sunnah, then dream is more important. If your purpose is close to Quran and Sunnah, purpose is more important. Some people may have the dream that my dream is to go to Janat Firdaus. Very good. So, whichever is closer to Quran and Sunnah, that is more important. 
whichever if you judge according to Quran and Sunnah, suppose your purpose is to go to Jannah, but your dream is to go to Jannah Firdo, then dream is more important than purpose. If your dream is to become an actor, but the purpose is to go to Jannah, then your purpose is more important than your dream. So unless you don't tell me your dream and your purpose, I cannot tell you which is more important. According to the Muslim, for the Muslim, which is the ultimate goal? Which is the ultimate goal for a Muslim? Jannah. Jannah. You can only answer of what knowledge you have. Is there anything higher than Jannah? No. Of course. Jannah is Firdos. Is there anything higher than Jannah is Firdos? Jannah is Firdos or Allah? Is there anything higher than Jannah is Firdos or Allah? What is it? The ultimate happiness, the ultimate goal for a pious Muslim is to see the Waj of Allah. Everyone in Jannah will not see the Waj of Allah, the face of Allah. The highest level that a Muslim can desire is to desire to see the face of Allah in Jannah al Firdaus al Ala maximum time. Because even in Jannah you desire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not show his face to everyone in Jannah. Jannah is, is the minimum goal. Higher is Jannah the Firdaus, than the Firdaus. Because in Jannah there is Jannah. A place close to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where we see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the highest level is that. So if your dream is that, yes. then mashallah, very good. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Allah Thank, you. Thank you. Now moving on to the next questioner, the brother on my left. Please state your name, your profession, and also your question briefly. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, doctor, for your uh, educative lecture. My name is uh, Shamsuddin Muhammad Ahmad, uh, PhD student with uh, University of Malaysia Police. Uh, actually, uh, the lecture is what is the purpose of life? As you said, doctor, the purpose is to serve Allah and we need to have a plan on ground for us to achieve what we want to achieve. You give example of Sheikh Didat who has done a lot, contributed in the field of comparative religion. Actually, since 2010, we developed interest in the area of comparative religion, especially in my country because of the nature of the country having non-Muslims, many non-Muslims. We were able to establish a center named after his name, Sheikh Ahmad Didat International uh, Comparative Religion Foundation. And at that time, Yusuf Didat was there to launch the, the foundation. My question is that, the challenge we have, the comparators, especially the comparative religion students, we always ask ourselves, when we look at the way Sheikh Didat delivers lecture, how he memorized Quran, Bible, then we came to realize that Sheikh Didat named you as Didat Plus. So whenever we are discussing among ourselves, we say that Sheikh Ahmad Didat, uh, Dr. Zakir Naik, some people, they call you a magic. So my question is that, as comparators, as students of comparative religions, what is the secret of having a retentive memory? What is the secret of memorization of the Quran? What is the secret of uh, viable? Doctor, I want you to reveal the secret today. What is the magic? Thank you, Doctor. The brother asked me that. <laughs> yeah, I've been inspired by Sheikh Ahmed Dida that started a center in his country. And Sheikh Didad has called me Didad Plus. That was the humility of Sheikh Didad that he called me Didad Plus. But he's asking me, what is the secret of that quotation of the Quranic verses, the Bible, etc.? What is that secret? Brother, it is an open secret. And I've said that many a time. The secret, it is a glorious Quran. Allah says in the Quran number one in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 160. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their faith in Allah. Number one is the help of Allah. Without the help of Allah, you can never achieve anything. You may have the best of technique, best of knowledge. My knowledge, if you compare my knowledge to the other Muslims, there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of people more knowledgeable than me. I'm nothing. If you look at my background, I was a stammerer 
since childhood. If anyone asked me the name when I was a child, I would say my name is Da 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 Kid. I was the summer. If I dreamt, I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world. I couldn't have dreamt of become speaking in front of 25 people. I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world. Possibly in a dream you can dream anything. But I was so bad in public speaking. I was a stammerer. Even in my dream, I could not speak in, could not think or dream of speaking in front of 25 people. But if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one. Number two, Allah says in Surah An-Kabut chapter 29 verse 69, if you strive, if you do jihad, if you struggle in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah opens up your pathways. What you have to do is struggle and strive. If your pathway is not open, who's to blame, Allah or you? Who's to blame? Allah or you? Allah says that if you strive and struggle, Allah will open up your pathways. If your pathways are not open, who is to blame? You or Allah? Who is to blame? You. That means you are not struggling correctly, you have to strive harder. If you strive harder, you have to get success, it's mentioned in the Quran. Number one is Allah's help, number two is striving. Number three, Allah says in Surah Nail chapter 16 verse 43, and Surah Abiyya chapter number 21 verse number 7, Fasalu ahli zikri in kuntula talamun. If you don't know, ask the person who's knowledgeable. Last is technique. People ask me, brother, what's the technique? Technique is last. Number one is Allah's help. How do you get Allah's help is important. You read the Quran, implement on the teachings of Quran and the authentic hadith, Allah's help will come to you. The more you strive to fulfill the commandment of Allah, the more Allah gives you success. I could not dream in speaking in front of 25 people and mashallah inspired by Sheikh Didal I started speaking 100 people, 1000 people, 10,000 people, 100,000, 1 million people you know when I started my knowledge was less and now so it is less I thought okay I'll become like Sheikh Didal Sheikh Didal had spoken to 12,000 people in Birmingham with the debate with Anis Soros I thought okay one day inshallah I will, I will address an audience of 12,000 that was that was the wrong, wrong goal. I was very young. Then I realized that how many people you speak to is not the target, is not your goal. But Allah made me fulfill my, my wrong goal also. 10,000 people, 100,000 people, 1 million people, Alhamdulillah. That is not the goal. Our goal is Jannah. So man, number one is the help of Allah. To acquire the help of Allah, you have to strive in the way of Allah. And follow the hadith and the Quran. And last is technique. That is planning. First is Allah's help. Then is striving. Then you plan. Okay, see to it that you go to a person who is an expert. See to it that he may give you technique. But number one is Allah's help. Then is striving. And third is technique. And inshallah, inshallah, we have in our school young children, age of 10, 12, 15, they rattle off verses of the Quran. Mashallah. I am not Hafiz al Quran, they are better than me. They can rattle off better than me. Bible, Quran, my son. MashaAllah. English is better than me. Arabic is better. I, I don't know Arabic as a language. My son speaks Loka Fusa. My daughter speaks Loka Fusa. My daughter's English is much better than me. But I always tell my children if Allah doesn't help you, all your knowledge is useless. First, you have to strive to get Allah's help. And the only way you can get Allah's help is if you strive. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He help us to fulfill our goal and our purpose in life and may He raise all of us in Janita Firdos, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Now we move on to the last question from the sister to my left, right behind. Please state your name, your profession, and your question briefly. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Siti Ansha Azhar. I'm a UITM student in Diploma in Science. And my question is, what should the patient, patient to do have purpose on life rather than commit suicide? Thank you. Sorry, I did not hear the question, sister. Can you, can you repeat the can question? Can you repeat please? the question, please, sister? Slowly. 
What should the patient patient to do? Sorry, what should you? Uh, the patient uh, patient to do to have a purpose on life rather than commit suicide. What should? Depression patient. Depression. 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 Uh, what should a depressed person do? Yes, yes, to do uh, to have purpose on life rather than uh, commit suicide. What should a depressed per person do to have purpose on life when he wants to commit suicide? Rather than commit suicide. Rather than commit suicide, ah, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> the sister asked the question, what should a depressed person do to have a purpose in life rather than commit suicide? The best is? Uh, read the Quran. <laughs> Master key. <laughs> this Quran, no secret, open secret, master key. The glorious Quran is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a warning to the heedless. It's a guide to the erring. It's a hope to those in despair. It's a solace to the suffering. And it's a guide to the erring. So this Quran is a wealth. If you read the Quran with understanding, it is the best solution for the problems of humanity. You know, my father, he was a psychiatrist. May Allah have mercy on him. And he was one of the first psychi Muslim psychiatrists of the country. This Quran is the best treatment for most of the psychological diseases. Because a, a person is depressed. Why? Why is he depressed? He feels what is the purpose of living. So if you don't have a purpose of living, what do you do? You want to commit suicide. You may think, okay, my purpose in life is that I want to earn maybe 10,000 ringgit a month. Oh, I'm only earning 2,000 ringgit. What do you do? You want to commit suicide. <laughs> Correct? You may say, okay, my, my purpose in life is that, you know, I want to come out first in university. Okay. You cannot come out first. Then what do you do? You want to commit suicide. You feel that you are a failure in life. You are a failure in life. If you read the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when a person wants to earn 10,000 ringgit, 20,000 ringgit, if you read the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the two rakah sunnah of Fajr that you read is more valuable than the world and the wealth in it. If you read two rakah sunnah of Fajr, you are more richer than Bill Gates. Our Prophet said, two rakah sunnah of Fajr, is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. Does Bill Gates have all the wealth in the world? No. Not even 0.1%, 0.001%. But you should have that faith. And if you know that if you are going to strive for the Akhirah, where you will get Jannah as the Quran says, with rivers flowing beneath the earth, with best of fruits and multiple things, then and if you read, if you commit suicide, you'll go to hell. Then will you commit suicide? If you read the verse of the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 195, do not make your own hand the cause of your own destruction. Suicide is haram. It's one of the major sins in Islam. So then he says, okay, this life is temporary life, 50 years, 30 years. If I have problems in 30 years, Akhirah eternal, Jannah, will he commit suicide? treatment the Quran has the best treatment the Quran is the best healing so for such people the best is Quran and say hadith and inshallah the solace they will have the peace they will have the tranquility they'll have they would want to live so that they enter Jannah hope that answers the question sister